In the previous video, we looked at our first abstract task, classification. In this video, we'll see some others. First up, regression. Regression works exactly the same as classification, except we're predicting a number instead of a class. That is, the model we're trying to learn is a function from the feature space to the real numbers. To make things a little bit more precise, Let's introduce some notations for the different parts of the task. We represent the features of a particular instance i by the vector xi. The corresponding true label, which is given in the data, we call ti. The model we represent by a function f, and its prediction for instance i we represent as f of xi. This means that, broadly, our task is to get f of xi as close as we can to ti. To illustrate some basic approaches to this problem, we will use the same data set as before, but this time we will make flipper length the sole feature, and we will try to predict the body mass. In general, penguins with large flippers should be tall, so we'd expect them to have higher body mass. So a reasonable guess should at least be possible. Note that in this case we have a one-dimensional feature space, which is one axis of our figure, and the target value makes the other axis of our figure. We can once again use a linear model. We draw a line to help us predict the target feature. Note, however, how differently we're using the model. Previously, when we built a classifier, we wanted to segment the feature space into two classes. Now we're using the line to model the relation between the features and the target. The model has the same shape, but we're using it very differently. The line I've drawn here isn't very good. It predicts much too high a body mass for this flipper length. To determine how good a model is, we must again choose a loss function. Recall that the loss function maps a model to a number that expresses how well it fits the data. The smaller the loss, the better. The mean squared error loss is a common choice for regression. We simply take the difference between the model prediction and the target value, we square it, and we sum it over all instances in our data, and then divide by the total number of instances to get an average. The difference between a model prediction and the target value is called the residual, and we can plot them like this. The line represents all the values predicted by our model, and the distance from the line to the actual value is our residual. If we square and then sum all the residuals we get, this gives us a single number, and the lower that number is, the better the model fits our data. If you like, you can think of the residuals as rubber bands, pulling the regression line closer to the points. A good training algorithm reduces the tension in the rubber bands as much as possible. This is the line with the lowest mean squared error loss for our data. It doesn't predict all instances in the data perfectly, but it's a pretty good start. We can also use the decision tree principle to perform regression, giving us a regression tree. We simply segment the feature space into blocks, using a tree as before, and instead of assigning a class, we assign each a number. This model covers the data much better than the linear regression does. For many points, it predicts exactly the right value. But does this make it a better model? Do we really expect that it's possible to predict body mass in such detail from just one physical measurement? We'll look at this question in the last video of this lecture. For the sake of completeness, here is what the regression equivalent of the KNN classifier looks like. KNN regression. Its prediction for any given point is simply the average of the k nearest points in the data. In this case, we have set k to 7. This hopefully gives you some idea of the different ways there are to build a regression model. In the next lecture, we'll look in detail at how a linear regression is done. And in later lectures, we'll start looking at different nonlinear methods in detail as well. Next up are the unsupervised tasks. In classification and regression, each instance comes with a label, an example of the sort of output we want our model to predict for each input. In unsupervised tasks, we only have the inputs. The task for the model is just to find any useful structure in the data. A simple example is clustering. In this case, we ask the learner to split the instances into a number of clusters. The number of clusters is usually given beforehand by the user. 
So we take our data, which has no target column, we feed it to a learner, the learner produces a model, and the model produces for a new unseen instance of the data, a cluster ID. This looks a lot like classification, but note that there are no example classes provided by the data. The learner simply has to find some structure that it can use to divide up the data. Here's an example from the Penguin dataset. If we plot the bill length and bill depth, we see that the three species separate pretty clearly in this feature space. If we remove the information that there are separate clusters, can we then recover it purely from these two features alone? Note that this is not classification because we are not giving our learner labels. We're not telling it the species of any instance in our data set. It has to figure out a clustering purely from the natural separation of the data. The only hint we'll give it is the number of clusters we expect to find, three in this case. We'll show one quick example of a simple clustering algorithm just to give you an impression of how something like this might work. This algorithm is called k-means, not to be confused with k-nearest neighbors. In the example, we will separate the data set into three clusters. We start by choosing three random points in the feature space, the red, green, and blue points. We call these the means. Each of these represents one of our clusters. We then assign each point the cluster corresponding to the mean it is closest to. So for these points over here, we assign them all the blue cluster because they are closest out of all the three means to the blue mean. These points over here are assigned the green cluster because they are all closest to the green mean. And these points are assigned the red cluster because they are closest to the red mean. Since we chose the means randomly, this does not yet correspond to a very meaningful clustering of the data. Next, we recompute the means. Each new mean is now the mean of all the points that belong to its cluster. That is, the new red mean is now the average of all the points that we've colored red in the previous step. And same for the green and the blue mean. Then we repeat the procedure. We reassign each point to the mean they are now closest to. The means change positions, so some points will now be closer to a different mean. Highlighted here are the points that have changed from one cluster to another. For instance, the highlighted red points were all blue before because they were closest to the blue mean, but now that we've recomputed the means and the blue mean has moved over to the left, they are closer to the red mean. We keep iterating this process, reassigning the clusters and then recomputing the means, reassigning the clusters and recomputing the means, moving from one iteration to the next. Here's the clustering we end up with after a couple of these iterations. We don't know what these clusters mean, of course, without investigating further, but in this case, they correspond pretty closely to the species of the penguin. It may seem a little magical to you that this algorithm works at all. We won't try to give you any intuition here, just take this as an example of how clustering might work in practice. In a later lecture, we will see another algorithm called expectation maximization, which is very similar to k-means, and there we will try to provide some intuition for why this sort of approach works. So that's clustering. Next up, we'll look at density estimation. In density estimation, we want to learn how likely new data is. Is a 2 meter 16 year old more or less likely than a 1.5 meter tall 80 year old? We predict a number for each instance, and that number expresses how likely the model thinks the given instance is. In some ways, this is a bit like an unsupervised form of regression. We don't have any labels, and the model produces a number. Note, however, that here the number has a strict interpretation. The higher the number, the more likely the instance. In the strictest form of density estimation, the number that the model produces should also behave as a probability or a probability density. This means that it can't be a negative number and all numbers the model produces over the whole feature space should sum or integrate to one. That may sound abstract, but density estimation is probably the machine learning task that most people listening to this have already done before. Density estimation is the task of modeling the probability distribution behind your data. Most of you will have fit a distribution to a data set at some point. Here is an example. The final grades of machine learning from 2017. If you know a bit of statistics, you can probably see sort of a normal distribution in this. Once you've fitted the normal distribution, 
you can give a density estimate for any grade. If we look closer at this data, however, we see that there are really three peaks. This could be explained by noise, but we could also fit a mixture of three normal distributions to this data to explain the peaks. This is a much more difficult model to fit, and we'll investigate this problem in a few weeks. For now, the lesson is that for simple models like a normal distribution, density estimation is so easy, it's not usually even seen as machine learning. But as the models get more complex, the task gets more complex also. With very, very complex data, such as a data set of human faces, it's often easier to sample from a probability distribution than it is to get a probability density estimate. Building a model from which you can sample new examples is called generative modeling. These people, for example, don't exist. These pictures were sampled from a model trained on a large data set of images of faces. This is a typical example of the power of deep learning, which we will discuss in depth in an upcoming lecture. This model couldn't tell you the probability density of a given face, but it can quickly generate new realistic faces. This concludes our discussion of the supervised and unsupervised tasks. However, in many cases, it can be beneficial to combine the two approaches. This is because unlabeled data is very cheaply available, while labeled data can be very expensive to acquire because it needs to be annotated by hand. In such cases, semi-supervised learning can be useful. This involves learning from a small labeled data set and a large amount of unlabeled data with the same features. A very simple example is self-training. We train a classifier on the labeled data and we use it to complete the data set. Then we train on the full data and we repeat the process. From this example, it's slightly mysterious why the unlabeled data should provide any benefit. For now, we'll just say that the classifier trained on the whole data can better understand the basic structure of the instances and then attach the label based on that deeper understanding of the structure. Recently, people have been referring to a family of methods as self-supervised learning. It refers generally to different ways in which a large unlabeled data set can be used to train a model in such a way that no or little annotation is required. One example is in the domain of natural language. For this, we will need a sequential model. These models we will learn about later on. For now, all you need to know is that they consume sequences, like sentences, and they produce such sequences as well. This means that we can feed such a model sentences with one or more of the words masked out and teach it to reconstruct these words. To do this, all you need is a large amount of sentences and we have petabytes of those freely available on the internet. The unmasking task by itself may not be very useful, but a model that has learned to do this well has likely learned a lot about the structure of sentences, which means it can then be used to build on for other more useful tasks, possibly using a small amount of labeled data. Semi-supervised learning and self-supervised learning have a lot in common, and it's not quite clear where one begins and the other ends. In general, Supervised learning refers to deep learning models and to clever training schemes using unlabeled data. We'll see some more examples when we start talking about deep learning. So this is the picture we have built up so far of the various abstract tasks of machine learning. We will spend most of our time in the supervised learning category, but the techniques we will develop will translate very naturally to other categories as well. This is what we have discussed so far. We've talked about abstracting your problem into instances, features, and target values. We've discussed supervised learning tasks, such as classification and regression, illustrated these with linear models, tree models, and nearest neighbor models. We've discussed unsupervised methods, like clustering, density estimation, and generative modeling. And in all cases, we've discussed the importance of using a loss function, a function that maps a choice of model to a loss for the current data. And the lower the loss, the better.